are Doctors Without Borders, but we are a French organization. So in French, our name is Médecins Sans Frontières, which is MSF. So throughout the exhibit, we will refer to our cells of MSF, um, and partially because it sounds a lot cooler than DWBs. No, that won't work. So MSF we are. You have been assigned a new citizenship, yes? You have your citizenship card? Yes. Well done. Mm -hmm. On it is stamped your <coughs> legal status. So take note, you are either a refugee, an internally displaced person, or an asylum seeker. So this you will need later, but to remember for yourself. A couple of things. Uh, our principles. Who are we as an organization? <laughs> we are a humanitarian medical organization. So that means everything we do starts and begins with our patients. So we pride ourselves in being impartial, being neutral. So in the middle of a civil war, we may have government soldier, insurgent, rebel group, and the John Jue all in the same hospital beds. Because if they are willing to leave their weapons, we are willing to treat them as patients. So with neutrality, impartiality, comes this notion of it doesn't matter to us how you became a patient. If you have been shot, you have a new hole in you somewhere, we will fix it. It does not matter who gave you this hole. It does not matter how it started and who said what and when and when and they did this. If you can leave your weapons at the door, you can be a patient of ours. And we do this with some flexibility all over the world. Because the idea of being a humanitarian medical organization means we take what the people need rather than distributing what we have. So sometimes that means going to a place and just sitting to listen, to watch, to make sure that we are understanding what the problem is, and then we go about dispatching help here, there, everywhere food, medicine. Sometimes it's just they need clean water to help stop the cholera outbreak. So we pride ourselves in being medical, we pride ourselves in being humanitarian. In that mandate is also this notion of bearing witness. So that's what this exhibit is. This is our version of see something, say something. This means all of the guys that you're seeing, some are doctors and nurses, logisticians, electricians, plumbers, they all help to make a project successful, and they all have their own perspective. So my perspective begins with women and children, because that's my line of work. So we will talk about families, we'll talk about how families are impacted by the need to leave, as well as what happens after they leave their homes. <laughs> so I started, my first mission was in June of 2011, when this was still one country. This was Sudan. But the South was scheduled to secede. So in, as independence was approaching, we weren't sure what was going to happen to our patients. The people who lived near that border, cattlemen, farmers, they weren't sure if their land would be in the middle of an international border. And cows don't recognize international borders, so there was that as well. So the idea of everything you own just walking away. As well, there wasn't a hospital that was nearby. So patients on the other side of the border had to decide where they were going to live in order to be close to a hospital. And that was part of my job, was sort of helping to figure out if the medical needs of the mother could be addressed on this side, or if it was safe enough for her to walk back to her land to live there. And that answer is complicated and unfortunate in a lot of ways. So this is, some of you are South Sudanese. Yes, because in July of 2011 was the independence. So you're now a sovereign nation, but a lot of you are internally displaced. So all of the red countries are places where we have a project of some sort. We operate in 60 to 70 countries, depending on what's happening in the world. That number fluctuates. So a couple of years ago, this country was red because Super Storm, storm Sandy. We had internally displaced persons. Hurricane Katrina as well, internally displaced persons, people who were still in their country, but it wasn't safe for them to go home. So if you are South Sudanese, you may be from Burundi, this country here, small, small, Syria, Afghanistan, and also Honduras. So you all represent those five countries today. We're going to focus on those five, in part because they're so different, but I think you will notice as we travel, as we go through the exhibit, they are a lot same-same, but in different parts of the world. 
of bearing witness to accountability our countries. We're going to also go into the dome. The dome is a 360 degree video presentation and it is the only part of this exhibit that is off limits to cameras. Because of the way the light bounces off the dome, you'll see when you get there, that's the only part that we ask you not to. But it is meant to be experienced. Everything else that you'll see today, you can touch it, you can experience it, we can talk about it. If you want to continue to bear witness, you're welcome to do so via social media networks. I'm not entirely sure how that works. My oldest daughter operates my Twitter account, so <laughs> I'm not really sure. But if that's your thing, you are welcome to. So the dome, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced. Where? Okay. Okay. So we talked a little bit about internally displaced persons. That means you have not crossed an international border. You are still in your home country, and you can't go home for some reason. So hurricanes, natural disasters, it's just not safe. Where you live slid off the side of a cliff, or it was flooded, or there was a fire even. So internally displaced is unique in that they are still at home. It is also problematic because they are not refugees. In order to be a refugee, you have to cross an international border. So because they are still at home, all of that UN aid isn't coming. No one's coming because they don't qualify. After World War II, we had 40 million-ish people that were displaced. So we got together, UN High Commission of Refugees, and we made some rules that we all agreed to buy by. So if you get refugees, you have to treat them a certain way, you have to do these things, and there's rules to this, right? But if you aren't a refugee, you don't do anything. So South Sudan, Burundi, Syria, a huge population of internally displaced persons. The majority of the Syrians aren't refugees, they are internally displaced. About two thirds are still moving around from place to place. Either they cannot get out of Syria because there are soldiers placed various places, or there's just too much bombs, it's not safe to travel that way. So they are staying inside of their country, but there isn't any help that is coming. Refugees, asylum seekers, you all are slightly different as well. Asylum seekers are refugees have started this process of verifying their citizenship, declaring themselves unable to go home, as well they are now eligible for sanctuary in another country. So it is possible that your new country requires a language. Some countries have an official language and you have to learn it. Some of them have parliament, some have an emperor, some have a high council. You gotta learn it. You need a civics lesson for your new country, as well as the national anthem and customs, holidays, and the language. So you may be in a camp situation for a while, but as long as you are learning the new customs, the new language of your new place, you will do well. To all, some of you have uteruses. Oh, good. Okay, so refugees from 27 countries in our world have found themselves in a unique predicament because those 27 countries citizenship is not transferable maternally. So if any of you arrive with a child in utero or with you, and you do not have a male citizen who is willing to vouch for her parentage, you are no longer a citizen of where you left. Because there is no one who will vouch for you. Because if you can remember, a lot of you are rural farmers. You've never been to the capital city. You sure don't have a passport. And all we have to do is go to the post office, 65 bucks, get your picture, and the State Department guesses that about 15 to 20 percent of us have a valid passport. So if you can imagine people who have never left their village and don't celebrate their birthday because it's not a cultural tradition, it's just not a thing in a lot of places. People don't know how old they are. When I ask women from South Sudan and Burundi how old they are, they tell me, oh, my first daughter has, has gotten her first period. She's menstruating now. Or I have four children, one guy. So I can reverse the math, you know? But she doesn't know what her birthday is. It's just not a thing. And to that end, you may find yourself stateless. You may arrive in the place that we talked about in those videos, having endured God knows what along the way. 
But if your husband was killed along the way, you are a stateless person. Which means, one, you are not a refugee. Because in order to be a refugee, you have citizenship in one place, and then you went to another place. But without those two things, you are stateless. So we will find that we have camps that have generations of people who can't leave, because they will never be citizens of here. And when they got here, they found out that they aren't citizens of there anymore. But as parents, we do a couple of things the same way all over this world. We keep our babies safe. So we talk to people who are in this stateless circle, and they tell you, well, yes, there are difficulties. Children get sick. We can never go home. They don't have schools because we aren't citizens. You can't go to public school if you're not a citizen. My babies are safe. I can listen to them laugh. I can tuck them at night. There aren't bullets flying. There's no one coming to auction them. So when my children want shoes and nice things, of course I want yes. and braces and, and good schools. But when I leave to go to a princess party play date, my baby girl says, I am ready to go. <laughs> All right, baby girl, take a step back. You can't fit in your car seat with the lights on your dress. It doesn't stay. Take your dress off. Get in your car seat and you click it correctly. And then when we get there, I will dress you again. Oh, mama, you don't love me. <laughs> I can't go anywhere without my purple princess party play date dress. But no, no, no. I keep you safe first. And if that means living in camps until you are an adult, take it. I take it every time. Because my job is to keep you safe. If I can listen to you laugh, if I can watch you breathing slowly at night, and touch your hair just so you stir, I can show you're still breathing, I'll take it. I prefer good schools and braces, princess party dresses, I do. But God willing, I never have to choose. But if I have to, I choose her safety every time, first and foremost. And that is the thing that makes you all the same. You'll do what it takes. Even if it means statelessness, internally displacedness, yeah, that's a word. Learning a new language, changing religion. We keep our babies safe. We do it at all costs. And we do it all over the world. Come on. the move. So for those of you that came from Syria and Afghanistan, you had houses that had flushing water and sink, potable water that you could drink from your faucet, your toilets flushed. You have to learn to use a latrine. As well, you cattlemen and farmers who are used to going out in the bush to do your business, that is no longer an option. Because if some of us decide to go out in the bushes, in the woods, and do our, because we need some privacy perhaps, when the rains come, that mixes with the mud, groundwater, and now our drinking water is contaminated. So we have to educate people. Are you still using the treats? My first mission was Sudan. And I had never crossed the Atlantic Ocean. I had never used a latrine. I had never, 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 name all the things, never. <laughs> so I had to learn to lose, use a latrine. So you'll see here, this is uh, as much privacy as you're going to get. This plastic is sort of like duct tape, but it's not sticky on the back. It's like sticky plastic stuff. And that is the door. And this is the floor of the latrine. Under the floor is a three meter pit. About the same size as the latrine itself, but underneath that's been dug out. The only thing that goes to the pit is what leaves your body. No toilet paper. No products of any nature because it, we rely, excuse me, on the circle of life, as it were. So there are creepy crawly things that live down there that eat poop, and we rely on them. And also, as we empty the latrines, the papers clog it all up. So there'll be a little trash can to put the toilet paper in it, if that's your thing. But what goes in the hole has to only be biologic waste. So here's what I learned, first mission. Go on the latrine, and first you... Let them know you mean business. Because they will scurry and <laughs> stomp on the floor. They are not so small. I respect their job, I respect their place in the circle of life. I don't want to spend too much time with them. 
the other problem is uh, they have a slightly different temperament. So while you are doing your business, which has to go in the hole, you need to keep your feet moving because they will crawl up your legs while you are still doing the business. So this is the blue ballet. It's very, very delicate. You have to keep your hips steady so you don't put any business on your shoes. But you have to keep your feet moving. So this is what I learned my first mission. Because when I left the latrine, my entire staff, 23 we were. Yay. <laughs> so I made it to the latrine and I still managed to cut my pants because I didn't realize all of the things that were going to happen in there. And they knew that I didn't know. So when I came out, they were all laughing and clapping. And it was, it was a humbling experience <laughs> that I will never forget for sure. But it underscores how important it is when we are living big numbers together, we have to all use a latrine. Even if you're a good looking surgeon, everybody uses a latrine. <laughs> so we live together like this. Whoever uses the last water, fills up the next one. It doesn't matter your degree, you took the last, you fill it up. But in a camp setting, hundreds, thousands, lots of people, we have to make sure the water is clean and safe. Depending on where we are in the world, that varies. Desalination, river water that's treated, wells that are dug, and it depends on where we are. If that source of water is too far, we can fill up one of these big yellow water bladders and then truck them in. But either way, it will be hooked up to this watering station. So each and every person gets five gallons of water per day. I think over the age of two, but I'm not entirely sure. But certainly Miss Lila cannot carry five gallons of water especially since our camp is vast. We put the watering stations in strategic locations, but it may very well be that your tent is a half mile to a mile away from the watering station. And that's when you'll see those pictures of women walking with one on the head, one in their hand, one in the other, I can't do it, one in the other hand because it is their day to catch water, or maybe they have two small ones who can't carry their own, so they're carrying two children's water plus their own back to their tent. And that is five gallons per person per day. Americans average about 90 gallons per person per day. Partly because I guess we don't have to carry it. We just turn on the water. And it but that's the water that we cook with. So when your pasta is finished and you throw it out, uh, that counts. The water that goes down while you wait for the shower to heat up, that counts. The water that goes when you flush. Some of you courtesy flush mid business. Mm -hmm. That water counts. The water that goes in your dishwasher, your washing machine, as well as the water that you're going to drink. So that adds up pretty quickly, partly because it's so easy for us to get it, but we're used to about 90 gallons a day. So those of you that have been working hard all your life and saved up for a house, you might find it a little bit more difficult to go to five gallons a day. But we have an allotment, we honor it. So basic needs also includes food. There's some beans and rice here. Sometimes there's fresh fruit. Cooking oil is there. Also some handicrafts, cooking utensils. Most people had to leave those things behind so you can get a pot or a pan or a spoon just to cook the food. The other thing that is here, does anyone still have their cell phone? Placard, not your real cell phone. Is one of your items, anyone still have the cell phone? Yes? Okay. Have you traveled abroad? Have you seen the other outlets? Okay, okay. So this one, hey, hey, hey. Oh, no, that's American. All right, so these are French, I believe. There's also some African outlets here because different parts of the world have different prongs for the wall. So this is common. You'll see a bunch of phones, a bunch of different outlets, and some manner to charge them. Small battery, solar panel from an abandoned construction site. So remember, a lot of these places before the war, before the natural disaster, they were about to put in some panel. And the people who lived there were engineers and electricians. So most places have a charging station of some sort. And we include it in this part of the exhibit because this is what we learned from our patients, that they will give up a day's rations or some fresh fruit in order to be able to use the phone. Because those numbers that we committed to memory, somebody is hoping to hear from you. And that is worth being a little hungry a little longer. When we were growing up, we had an uh, emergency dime, emergency quarter later. My mom would say, when you get where you're going, call the house, 
let it ring one time. Hang on. You put your shoe, your quarter back in your shoe, but this way I know you're safe. So as it relates to our work, the things that we learn from patients is that the ability to reach out and get touch with people at home is just as valuable as food and water. And we have to change how we do things. Because if we are blind to it, if we allow ourselves not to think the way our patients are thinking, then there's opportunities to exploit people. Because then you can sell, sell minutes for other goods and services. So we include it. We make it a part of our camp so that there is no pack market for it. There's just the market because it's that important to people. So come on. People don't survive all of us. Someone will say, like, some people get better. No people get better because people die of dehydration. The diarrhea is constant, the nausea, vomiting, constant, and you die of dehydration. If your blood just gets so thick that your heart can't pump it, then you die. So when that happens, we move it. We move it even if it's a whisper or a rumor of cholera because people will be dead before they can get to us. So we go to that. So break this tent down and everybody with at least one hand is helping. So my second mission, there was the possibility of a cholera outbreak. So I went to the hospital and I was like, okay, what are we gonna do? And like, get back to base and make beds. I didn't know why you say it like that. I didn't know. It never happened before. And this is exactly what I did. We wrapped the beds in that heavy plastic and we cut a hole in them. And because I'm the only surgeon, I have a scalpel. I dulled a bunch of them just making cholera beds. This is a cholera bed because it has a hole in it. Because the diarrhea is so profuse that people can't get to the toilet. So we have them sit on the bed. The bucket's underneath their bum, and they get another bucket for vomit. And that's how you treat cholera. IV access. See, this is a picture. There's this one standing at the front of a cholera tank. He's taking the photo. So this guy must be doing better because he's wearing pants. People who aren't well don't wear pants. It's just not, not going to work. But you can see this patient here. He's covering up this man business, and he's sitting on his bucket. We can change the buckets out and get a clean bucket every time we need to. And also the heavy plastic is easy to clean. And then every patient has an IV line hanging from the top of the tent. Can you see them there? Yeah. The white line. Because like treatment for cholera is about a dollar twenty-five worth of medicine. It's not that. It's just there's no other way to give it to them except IV. So it has to be done in this sort of a setting. If you give them the pills, they'll be out soon and they get no benefit from it. So we use their IV to replace the water that they're losing, you, the water that they're losing, and then we put the medicine in there as well. But this tent doesn't have to be a cholera tent. It can be a malnutrition station. No, I knew that. Okay. So if you can imagine, I'm not sure what age it is, but there's a point where if you put a little fat baby down, like as a triangle, like make their legs a triangle, they won't tip over. They can't pack yet, but they can sort of teeter. And at that age, they are deliciously chubby. Oh my goodness. I like to bite them. I like to squeeze them. Because they're just so chunky. So we do malnutrition screenings quickly and easily in a village in a day. The way we do that is a mua, which is the middle, upper arm circumference. Sort of the fat, chunky part of a baby's arm. So you can imagine a little one slobbering, making those little baby noises, and their arms should be about this big around. So that's a green zone. That's a healthy fat child. But as it gets smaller and smaller, so that's the yellow, orange, then red. So that same age in mind, this is entirely too thin for this part of their arm. So we can do this quickly, and we can have the mothers help us. We say, do this, we show them how to put it. Red, go that way. Greens, go that way. Orange and more yellow stay here. They will be evaluated on a one-on-one -on -one basis. This is not always clear. Sometimes we have the age wrong and we're using the wrong tool. Or they are getting over some other sickness, but on the mend. So those have to be evaluated. But this, this is a medical emergency. 
this is a child that must be treated in the hospital. Partly because the malnutrition makes their tongue swell. So even if we had a healthy, delicious meal for them, they wouldn't be able to swallow it. So they have to start with some IV intervention. But it's a quick and easy way to figure out who needs our help and how quickly we need to act. So this can be one of those. We can have a nurse or two here, two or three translators, and we just move them into which category they need to be and figure out who needs our help emergently. This can also be a vaccine tent. So when done well, we can do 1,000 to 1,200 vaccines a day. That requires an amazing, beautiful ballet of logistics. So we talked about impartiality, neutrality, bearing witness. The other thing that is specific and wonderful about MSF is we are independent. You pay cash for our drugs. Because when someone gives you things for free, you may find out later they weren't exactly for free. So from where the drugs are manufactured to the middle of absolutely nowhere, we have to get these drugs safely. They can't be above 72 degrees Fahrenheit or below 40 something. They can't get too cold, they can't get too hot. So there is what's called a cold, not hot, cold chain. The cold chain is made of people. And since I'm always actively recruiting, they're the people that I trust. Because I promised my children that I would get their mother home safely. So there's folks that I rely on in the field. And part of that means relying on them to save people's lives. So this box, I've seen it on tuk-tuks, camels, bicycles, planes, trains, automobiles. Because the cold chain has to be on it. It is me too. That is, I vouch for the contents of that box throughout its journey. And when I give it to you, you will take on the same responsibility. So when I was growing up, my grandmother said, uh, you need to be the same person in the dark and the light. Which means that sense of responsibility, even when no one is watching. Because there are times when it's just you in a doggone box trying to get from a border crossing or trying to figure out how to get past the river that wasn't on the map that we gave you because rainy season came early and that piece of the river wasn't there when you left. It's a sense of responsibility that means if I do drop it, the lock first, and it gets too hot or too cold, because Afghanistan in the winter is cold, too cold for those drugs. Sudan in the summer is too hot for those drugs. So I tell myself, done it. Because when I trained here in the U.S., I didn't know that the drugs that I use in the operating room are cold. Because my aspirin's not to me. I just never noticed. So the first time I left for the hospital, I had the thing that somebody gave me. She told me to carry it on. You know, I with the woman. I didn't realize what was in it. So I walked all the way there with the lid not on correctly. So when we got there, the drugs inside had been too hot. We know that because inside of the box, she was a thermometer. So if ever the drugs get too hot or too cold, it alerts. So we got to there. Here you go, I brought the thing you told me to bring. <laughs> you let the lid off? Yeah, sort of. It fell off. Oh my God, I didn't, I didn't know. I was just truly ignorant. 